So we have a big presentation before us today. So I want to go ahead and get started with um, Dr. Mangione's biosketch. So I'm just going to introduce Dr. Sal Mangione, sitting in the front row here, uh, is a clinical educator with a long interest in physical diagnosis, medical history, and community service. After he obtained his MD summa cum laude from the Catholic University of Rome, Dr. Mangione trained in internal medicine and pulmonary and critical care medicine at the Medical College of Pennsylvania before moving to Jefferson Medical College, where he is currently associate professor of medicine, associate program director for internal medicine residency. Residency, director of the second year physical diagnosis course and coordinator for the history of medicine lecture series and the Jefferson Medical Center Forum. Uh, Dr. Mangione's innovative programs and engaging teaching style have been recognized by multiple awards for excellence in clinical teaching, including the 2005 Golden Apple Award, the 2006 Jefferson Portrait Presentation, and the 2009 Lindback Award. His work has also been featured in the New York Times, the LA Times, the Wall Street Journal, the BBC, the CN CNN, and NPR. In the 90s, Dr. Mangione published a series of landmark articles on the decline of basic clinical skills like auscultation among primary care trainees. This launched an interest in rekindling the bedside, which eventually led to the introduction of objective assessment during both the national board exams, um, as well as during the uh, ABIM certification exam, which internists take. Dr. Mangione collaborated with the ABIM on a several research projects related to physical diagnosis and also served on the ABIM committee that developed the physical exam module for the internal medicine recertification exam. He has also served on the N M uh, NMBA NBME committee that finalizes clinical skills exams and has contributed to physical diagnosis chapters for the 14th edition of the ACP MixAP. Dr. Mangione has lectured extensively on bedside diagnosis, both nationally and internationally, including England, Canada, South America, and New Zealand, and Cornell. Um, he has been an invited speaker at many national and international meetings and multitudes of medical grand rounds, especially in regards to the role of visual arts as a way to teach bedside observation. In addition to his interest in clinical skills and medical history, Dr. Mangione has also been actively involved in asthma education, creating and directing for six years a unique and innovative vehicle, the Asthma Bus, a red double-decker bus that he, brought, that he bought in London in 1999, shipped to Philadelphia, and eventually outfitted so to provide asthma education and screening for 15,000 Philadelphia medical school, middle school children. I didn't know that. That's new to me. Um, for this, he received a community service award from the city of Philadelphia. Uh, the 2001 American Institute of Architects Award for the Most Innovative Exhibit, and the 2004 Presidential Award by the American College of Chest Physicians. Dr. Mangione is also part of Dr. Hojat's original team that developed the Jefferson Empathy Scale, uh, and he has maintained an active interest in rekindling empathy through the humanities. To this end, he has created the Jefferson History of Medicine course and the Medical Cine Forum. He's now at work to develop programs in theater and visual arts so as to foster empathy and observation among students. And it is a great honor and privilege for me to invite him here to speak with you all today. So please shut your computers, pay attention. It will be a whirlwind and an exciting lecture for you to watch. Thanks, I sent him Sal. a brief version. Eh? <laughs> I did send him a brief version, but he didn't use it. OK, so thank you for having me back. Actually, uh, it's kind of special because my wife was a medical student here. So it's nice to be here. Um, so this is a talk on an important part, which is the artistic aspect of medicine. Remember that the patron saint of medicine and art is actually St. Luke. So Luke was, of course, an evangelist, and he wrote the gospel. But at the same time, he was a physician. He was a Greek physician, so a good physician. And of course, he was also a painter. And he's credited to have painted the first portrait of the Madonna. The symbol is the winged dogs, which incidentally is the symbol of my medical school. So let's talk about the most artistic aspect. Problem with the art, it's dying. And this is Bernie Laun, who invented the defibrillator, but also went on to win a Nobel Peace Prize for founding physicians against nuclear war. And he's been complaining that today's physicians are more preoccupied with laying tools rather than hands. So clearly, the art of medicine is the bedside exam. And for many, many years, the bedside exam was primarily astute observation. It's only in the past 250 years that we added percussion and auscultation. Curiously, both of them came out of the brain of two very artistic physicians, very eclectic. The guy who invented percussion wrote librettos for operas. And as a kid, he used to go down to the family tavern basement and watch his father percuss barrels of wine to see if they were full or empty. That's how Leopold Oyenbrugger got the idea of percussion. Auscultation is actually very timely because the publication of the next book was 200 years ago today. Well, today, this year. And uh, this is another artist. Um, he wrote um, poetry in Breton language. He danced. He was a flute maker, and he played the flute. 
And actually, the original cylinder, as he called it, the stethoscope, was nothing more than a flute-like device. All right, so through it all, there was observation. And William Osler was the most artistic and uh, well-rounded of the physicians we produced in the past century, kept reminding us that all of medicine is observation. Well, he also warned us that there is no more difficult art to acquire than the art of observation. Let me give you an example. How many of you at first sight would notice that Audrey Hepburn on the right has a tiara? And you're going to say, who cares about Audrey Hepburn's tiara? Well, I'm a pulmonologist, and a few years ago I got a phone call from one of our fellows, Dr. Manjuna, and we got a consult. The patient has a chest mass. I looked at the CAT scan. He hadn't seen the patient, typical. But he's got a neck mass, and maybe we can uh, needle that, and we don't need to do a bronchoscopy. So I said, fantastic. Did you ask the intern if he saw anything at the bedside? So yeah, I called up the intern and said that there is nothing visible. So we went to see the patient, finally, and bingo, the intern had missed that. How can that be? Well, there are three reasons, according to Leonardo. There are people that are uh, capable of seeing, people that are able to see only when you tell them, and people that just can't see. The problem with Leonardo is that he was a Tuscan, he had a dry wit, and he had a chip on his shoulder. The reality is that there are only two types of people, the ones who have been taught how to do it and the ones who haven't. What happened to Leonardo, he was lucky enough to have a guy named Verrocchio who taught him how to see. He was the man Leonardo was apprenticed to when he was 12 years old. Verrocchio is actually an Italian word for vero occhio. He had a fine eyes. And how many Verrocchios are today in medicine? Particularly when you guys, as residents, you'll have to spend 40% of your time looking at a computer so that you can build more effectively, because that's the only reason, and only 12% of the time looking at a human being. It's called the McDonaldization of medicine, and you got to do something about it. But that's a topic for another day. The problem is that we do have, indeed, difficulty seeing things. Now, who's familiar with Otzi the Iceman? Anybody? Okay, so this guy was sticking out of the Italian glaciers, mostly because we're melting the planet. Today is 60. Uh, and a couple of German tourists that were hiking through the Italian Alps saw this guy sticking out, and they thought there was a soldier from World War I. So they brought in the best and the brightest of Europe to study it, and they realized that the guy was actually a mummy from 5,000 years ago. He was a hunter. They brought him back to Bolzano, where I spent six months training. They built a reconstruction of what this hunter would have looked like. They gave him a multi-million dollar facility to host the remains, but it took them 10 years to really finally see, and they had as x-rayed this guy quite a bit, that there was a stone-tipped arrow in the left subclavian region. Quite unsurprisingly, the first European on record was a murdered victim. He had been killed, and this thing bled him to death by puncturing the subclavian artery. Now, this is another good example of how you see, but you don't observe. This was a study, and they were trying to teach students how to take off on a simulation. They told them, look at a cockpit, and take off. By doing that, they distracted them. So they didn't realize that there was another plane on the tarmac, and of course, they ran into it. And they simulated a humongous disaster, and they wrote it up. And you're gonna say, well, it's not gonna happen to me next time I fly, but that's exactly a reconstruction of what happened back in 1977, the worst aviation disaster in history. A Pan Am jet, and of course, a KLM jet didn't see each other and 600 people died. All right, so let's play a game, because this is what we're talking about. We're talking about attentional capture and inattentional blindness. If you distract somebody by telling them, look at a computer so you can build more effectively, don't look at the patient, you're gonna miss a lot. So I want you to count the number of passes made by guys in black, only the guys in black. Thirty. 
40. All right, so there were 20 passes, but did you realize that there was a woman with an umbrella strolling through the gym? And the funny thing is that when they did this test, only 20% picked her up. Why? Well, they were being told to count the passes, and they got distracted. A few years later, they did the same study, but this time they used a guy in a gorilla suit. And you would have imagined a gorilla suit would have stood out, but in reality, less than half really saw him. So all of this is what we call inattentional blindness. Let's talk about it. So you don't really see things, or at least you don't observe them, when you're being distracted, which goes back to the computer screen. Then there is an auditory counterpart. And here is the interesting catch. If you're blessed with ADD, which is not a disability, it's actually a strength, you're going to be able to pick up a lot more. Studies have been done. People with ADD are much better observers. Because ADD is a horrible term. ADD is a label put by the farmers who inherited the earth, and only the surviving hunters from the previous time got labeled as hunters and distracted and put on Ritalin. When in reality, they are multitasking. These are the people that, in order to catch the prey without becoming a prey themselves, are paying attention to a lot of stuff. So here's the auditory counterpart. I have a little bit of ADD, and when I'm at dinner with my wife, I can hear her. The guys in the back were having a fight. The people on the other side were talking about Trump and still hold a conversation, even though she thinks I'm being distracted. But the reality is that I can multitask. Now, cause it Causes of inattentional blindness are that there is indeed distraction. So you don't really want to be distracted too much. You don't expect a guy in a gorilla suit to go through a gym. There is what we call inattentional, inattentional amnesia, which basically means if you don't really notice the stimuli, immediately you forget them. Because there is a gap between attention and recording. All of this means pay attention you have to force yourself to pay attention. Remember Sherlock Holmes? I force myself to see things that other people overlook. So here is how it works. When you are born, your brain learns very quickly that there is too much information coming in. It's flooding. So it picks up only a few details. But when you become a poet, a painter, when you become an artist, an investigator, a physician, a detective, you have to pick up all the detail. Because if you limit yourself to only a few trees, your brain will inform you that you're in an Amazonian forest when in reality are you in a Mediterranean forest. So let all the trees in. See them all. Now, there is a method, and curiously enough, physicians, physicians used to teach it for a lot of time because the man who taught him primarily was Osler himself. There is actually a paper on how Osler taught the method of Zadig. So let's talk about this. Zadig is a novelette by Voltaire, and it's about this person, Persian sage named Zadig that goes to the wilderness and becomes enlightened. And then emissaries of the king come and they say, have you seen the king's horse? And Zadig says, you mean the mayor that just delivered a colt that has a shoe made of silver and a limp? And they say, yeah, no, I haven't seen her. So they arrest him. They think he's lying, when in reality he's basing everything on astute observation of footprints. So Zadig caught the fancy of Edgar Allan Poe. So when Edgar Allan Poe wrote Murders of the Rue Morgue and concocted this detective named Augusto Penn, based him on Zadig. Zadig was practiced and taught by this lanky, absent-minded, and handsome Scot named Joseph Bell. This is a guy who could look at you, he was a physician, he, he could look at you and figure out on the way you look without asking a question, which part of town you were from, what was your job, what was your dominant hand, what was your hobby. And he doubled in forensic medicine. He's actually reported to have solved the riddle of Jack the Ripper. More importantly, he taught this clerk. His medical student to study with him was named Arthur Conan Doyle. And when Conan Doyle got out of medicine pretty quickly, within seven to ten years he was out and he became a full-time writer, he concocted this fictional character named Sherlock Holmes and he based him on Professor Bell. Even asked Bell to write the introduction to the first book in the series. 
And that book is called A Room in Scarlet. It has a beautiful description of the method of Zadig. So I'm going to read it to you. Here's the story. Uh, Watson is in London and uh, is back from Afghanistan where he was wounded. He's a military surgeon. And he goes to rent a flat in Holmes' apartment. Holmes is carrying out a chemical experiment, but he's still looking at him. And without asking a question, says, you're a military surgeon, and you just got back from Afghanistan where you were wounded. And Watson is flabbergasted. How do you know? So here's the description. I knew you came from Afghanistan. From long train of thought ran so swiftly through my mind that I got to the conclusion without being conscious of the intermediate steps. Yet they were there. The train of reasoning ran as such. So here is the first part of the method. Attention to detail. Here's a gentleman of a medical type, but with the air of a military man, clearly an army doctor. And he's got back from the tropics because his face is dark, but that is not the natural tint of his skin, because the wrists are fair. And he has undergone hardship and sickness, as his face states very clearly. And his left arm has been injured, because he holds it in a stiff and unnatural manner. Now that he has all the details, he uses deductive reasoning. Where in the tropics could an English army doctor have seen much hardship and got his arm wounded? Clearly in Afghanistan. The Brits were stuck there in those years. The whole train of thought did not occupy a second. I then remarked you came from Afghanistan and you were astonished. So a two-step approach. Pay attention to all the trees. Use deductive reasoning. Now, it's fun to be a Sherlockian physician. And so, these are a couple of papers, one written by Faith Fitzgerald, that is indeed a Sherlockian physician and a great observer. So to strive to do that. Now, that means pay attention to face, to body habitus, to ears, to eyes, to skin, to extremities, to thorax and abdomen. The reason why I put Vitruvian Man is actually intentional. So Vitruvian Man is Leonardo da Vinci at 39. It's a self-portrait, and Leonardo was a handsome man. And if you read it on Wikipedia, what he writes on their folio are nothing more than a blueprint of human proportions. And that's important. You need to know the normal so you can pick up the outliers. And then, of course, you need detail. So let's play the game. If you had a coffee with a friend who's a layperson, she would look at that and would say, this person looks funny. And you're going to say no, because you have, of course, medical knowledge. You're going to say, well, He's got prominent bosses, big cheekbones, a bulbous nose, a prominent chin, and he's got splay teeth. Why? Because with acromegaly, you get megaloglossia. You got a big tongue. This was Primo Carnera, a heavyweight boxing champion from the 1930s. They went on, of course, to die of complications from diabetes that he acquired as a result of his acromegaly. Let's keep on going. Take Mary, Queen of Scots. Mary was famous for being 6'3 at the beginning of her reign, but only 5'2 at the end of it, since her cousin Elizabeth I decapitated her. She also had long and slender fingers, pretty much like conservative columnist Ann Coulter. And here I used to say, well, it hasn't been decapitated yet, but we hope soon. And then I got a couple of medical students who reported me to the dean, so I can't say it anymore, and I'm not going to say it. <laughs> then there is Italian violin virtuoso Niccolò Paganini, who played chords uh, that were incredible because he had those kind of fingers. Tol and Lenke was Charles de Gaulle, and Tol and Lenke was Vincent Schiavelli. Now, Italian-American character actor, you might remember him in the movie Ghost. He was the New York subway angry ghost. Vincent had to get open heart surgery as a result of the condition that all these people had. And Osama Bin Laden was rumored to have it too. So what did they have? They had what the very first patient I ever saw as a freshly minted intern in an ordinary Italian Alpine hospital in that Bolzano, where uh, Ozzi was kept, had. So this was um, New Year's Day, 1981, and they told me, go in and do an HNP. She got admitted last night. She's 34. She just delivered a baby, but she has postpartum cardiomyopathy, heart failure, and she has mitral regurgitation. So I went in, and first of all, she had aortic regurgitation. They had blown that, and this was a cardiology division. But more importantly, she was tall and lanky like these guys. And curiously enough, she had funny hands. I want you to look at your hands. That's why you need to know the normal. Which is longer, the palm or the fingers? Usually it's the palm, and if anything, they should be the same length. 
but she's got very long fingers. The palm is relatively short. That's what we call arachnodactyly, the fingers of a spider. And then what you need to do once you see a patient like that, it's to tell them to juxtapose the thumb. And if the entire thumb phalanx protrudes, you got a Steinberg thumb sign. And then I did something that you guys can't do anymore because you don't carry ophthalmoscopes anymore. And when I tell my medical students, why didn't you buy an ophthalmoscope? Well, they're expensive, Dr. Manjuna, plus they have them in the office and in the patient's rooms. They don't. So the bottom line is that you don't know how to use it. But I did. I had one because I had trained here in the U.S. as a med student. And so I bought one, and I was able to see that this lady had a subluxated lens. So I went out and I told uh, the chief of medicine there, I don't think she has postpartum cardiomyopathy and she does not have mitral regurgitation. I think she's got Marfan syndrome and she's dissecting painlessly. They got very serious, they did an echo, which was the only thing they had. This was a small hospital. They confirmed that he had, she had a double chamber aorta and they put her on an helicopter. They sent her to the University of Verona. She was operated and saved and I got offered a job. Now, take a look at this kid, talking about proportions. Where is the center of the body, folks? Is normally the symphysis or the belly button? Let's vote. Who votes for the normal center of the body to be the symphysis? Raise your hands. Who votes to be the belly button? Okay, and the reason is because we don't teach you that. But the first thing you learn when you take a drawing class is human proportions. The center is supposed to be the symphysis. But these guys all shifted. He's all legs. One out of 10,000 of us have been roaming the planet looking like that, but it took 896 years after Jesus Christ for Dr. Marfan to say Marfan syndrome. Now, Marfan was an interesting man. He was a student of the arts, and he loved my beloved city of Venice. And guess what? It's in Venice the Vitruvian man is kept. And yes, for Leonardo, the center of the body is the synthesis, and I wonder whether Marfan got the idea by looking at Vitruvian man. People that hadn't looked at Vitruvian man looked at this man, oops, when he showed up three times in St. Vincent's Hospital emergency room in Manhattan complaining of chest pain. But he was tall and lanky, and he was an artist. He looked like a freak, and these guys were busy. So they said, listen, buddy, you're clearly nervous because he was telling them tomorrow my play is opening. I just got a tax with a few bucks I had in my bank account. Mom and dad are flying in. I'm really nervous, but this pain is killing me. So they sent him home on tranquilizers. And of course, he dissected to death on the kitchen floor. And this is Jonathan Larson. And the play was rent. Did they ever examine his pulses? Did they ever notice that his torso was shrunk? Point again is that the problem with you, Watson, is that you see, but you don't observe. And you can observe a lot by watching, said Yogi Berra. So pay attention. This is a good man. This was the right-hand man of Osler at Hopkins. He was also the brother of the guy who wrote in Flanders Fields, the iconic poem of World War I that made the poppy the symbol of that war. And he taught at my institution for 21 years. He was famous for saying, you miss more by not looking than by not knowing, which is totally the opposite of what we teach you. We teach you to learn a lot. Because we can do that very easily and test it on single best answer, black and white, multiple choice test. But how are you going to test observation? So we don't teach it. The result is that um, uh, Tom McRae wrote a paper on observation and how Hosler used to teach it. And in that paper he wrote, how careful a description can you give of the personal appearance, the clothing of the last patient that you ever saw? If you had been a thief who walked off with something from your office, could you describe him to the police? The people we meet on the street, those in the streetcars, all with whom we come in contact may serve as subjects. Nothing that trains the power of observation can be unimportant. And far from being tiresome, it's fun. So strive to be one of those upon whom nothing is lost. Okay? And that is a good advice. My suggestion is catch. Okay? So you're going to say, well, I never was good at sketching bullshit. And you know, when you were a kid, you were always crayoning away. Then you went to school, they took away the crayon, they gave you a pen, bad idea, and they turned you into a left brain thinker. They took away your capacity to see the world visually. So you could relearn it. Betty Edwards has, has, written, has spent a lifetime trying to teach people that say, I can draw, how to draw. 
And there is a great book, and I have no conflict of interest, called Drawing Along the Right Side of the Brain. Even comes with a DVD that teaches you how to do it. But drawing has a problem. It's supposed to be good. And you are a math student, so you have a humongous inner critic. And the inner critic is going to say, you know, you're really not good. You should be studying for the boards. So best thing is sketch. Sketch is supposed to be not particularly fancy. Even better, wake up in the morning and do it early in the morning because the inner critic is an old curmudgeon and so sleeps late. And even better, drink a glass of whiskey. <laughs> Don't do that. That gives you the illusion that you have the image, when in reality you have no idea what you have. I'll give you an example. This was a watercolor painter, but also a very good British critic. And of course, he loved imaging. So when the ghetto types became available, John Ruskin bought a camera. Since he loved my beloved city of Venice, I bought a house in Venice. That's my love for lost causes, physical diagnosis, the humanities, and now a sinking city. <laughs> but anyway, in uh, Venice, when uh, I got married a couple of years ago, they had an exhibit on Ruskin, because Ruskin took all these pictures. But then he realized that they were killing his powers of observation. So he threw away the camera and he went back to doing watercolors. And those became the famous stones of Venice. And he even became a zealot that taught anyone who wanted to learn how to draw. And people mused about it and they say, well, you're teaching plumbers, you want to turn them into Rembrandts? No, he said, I want to make them better plumbers. Pretty much like you. If you draw, you become a better physician. Example, well, Harvey Cushing drew all his life. He was convinced that it made him a better observer. This is one of his drawings of the area where you have to drill in order to get the epidural out. Now, of course, the best observer of them all was Leonardo da Vinci, who has been at the Bargello Museum in Florence. Anybody? Okay, next time you go there, on the left, there is the best trattoria in Florence. It's called Le Mossace. So make sure you don't miss it. They don't take reservations, and you have to order a ribolita. But I want you to go back to when this thing was actually the prison. Leonardo will spend several weeks there under anonymous accusations of sodomy. He was going to be executed. But then a couple of good kids from good families were caught in the dragnet. They let them all go, and Leonardo left Florence, and at the age of 28, goes to Milan. But I want you to go back to a time when Leonardo is still a free man and enters the courtyard to see a man executed by the Signoria. And he sketches him. But more importantly, he writes in Tuscan the way the guy is dressed. A ten-color skull cap, a doublet of black serge, a lime black jerking, and a blue coat lined with four of fox breasts. The jacket's collar is covered with a black and red stipple velvet, black socks, and then the name of the poor unfortunate soul. Why was Leonardo doing that? He was forcing himself to pay attention to detail. Because when you pay attention to detail, then the picture takes care of itself. And Leonardo was an amazing visual thinker. By the way, Leonardo might have been dyslexic. We just published a paper in the American Journal of Medicine on that, and that would explain a lot about the life of Leonardo. Anyway, let me give you an example. He goes to Milan, you know, leaves Florence, and immediately produces this masterpiece. So this past June, I was with my, my wife in Paris, and everybody at the Louvre was in front of the Mona Lisa. You couldn't even get closer. And nobody, nobody was in front of this thing. So this is the Virgin of the Rocks. It has a typical pyramidal structure, with the Madonna being the pinnacle of it. But I want you to look at this beautiful angel, which, according to Kenneth Clark, was the most beautiful face ever painted. And I want you to realize that he's dressed in red, white, and green. And you're going to say, oh, isn't that sweet of Leonardo, the Italian flag? No, there was no Italian flag in those years, and there was no Italy. Leonardo was a Tuscan. But Leonardo, curiously enough, painted the Angel of the Annunciation a few years prior, also in red, white, and green. And if you go to Florence, the cathedral marbles are, guess what? Red, white, and green. Why? because we lost the capacity to read symbolism. But in those years, everybody knew that red is the color of love, white is the color of faith, and green is the color of hope. And those are the three theological virtues of Christianity. That was a standard, so that wasn't complicated. However, 
the angel is also making a funny gesture. And so is the Madonna. And baby Jesus looks like Churchill. So <laughs> does anybody know how to read sign language? If you knew how to read sign language, you realize that the Madonna is making an L, the angel is making a D, and baby Jesus is making a V. And LDV are the initials of Leonardo da Vinci. That's his signature. Leonardo knew about sign language? Yes, Leonardo knew about everything. In fact, he was rooming with a family of painters in Milan, and one of them, the oldest guy, Cristoforo de Predis, who made this illuminated manuscript, was actually deaf and mute. Actually, people say that Leonardo might have contributed to sign language. All of this to say, you need to know a lot. The more you know, the more you see. Yes, you can observe a lot by watching, using the method. But again, the more you know, the more you see. Leonardo boasted about it. The acquisition of any knowledge is always useful to the intellect. That's where we got a problem. Because in order to get into medical school, you need to be very narrow focused. OK? All right, so can art help? And the answer is yes. Take a look, for example, at uh, this painting by David of a very middle-aged Napoleon. This one is uh, the National Gallery, and you're going to pay attention for three milliseconds and then move on. Another painting of Napoleon. The reality is that if you use the method of Zarig, this is good propaganda. How come? Well, first of all, the guy was a midget, but David portrays him by using vertical lines. They give us the illusion that the guy is a giant. Also, did you notice that the angle is pretty low? So again, gives us this illusion of height. In addition, David puts the bees of the Merovingian kings, the original kings of France, on that chair, which gives us a sense of continuity, continuity with our great past. So he's a great man. Well, what kind of a man is he? He doesn't look that good. He looks disheveled. Look at the stocking. Well, that's because it's 4.15 in the morning, and the candle is almost out. Why? Well, he's been up for us. He's been working all night for France. What's he planning to do? Well. That's a map, and that is a sword. He's a man of action. In fact, that map is a map of a country he's planning to invade. Should we worry? No, he's also a man of law. That's the Napoleonic Code, so we should sleep safe. And of course, he's a great man. That's Plutarch, the great lives of the Greeks and the Romans. Of course, this is not the right conclusion, because that map is Russia, and he's planning to invade it in 1812. So all of this to tell you how calm how much you can observe. Now, the first people that did this kind of uh, study were the Yale people. And they found that this can make med students able to detect 9% more physical findings. Then they tried it at Harvard. And this time, the med students pick up 38% more physical findings. You say, why the difference? Folks, because this is now something you measure with single best answer, black and white, multiple choice test. And if we can't measure it, we're not going to teach it. Because that's why you guys come up and say, what you just told me, all this stuff that is interesting, but is it going to be on the test? And I say, no, it's not going to be on the test, but it's going to make you a better human being. And of course, if it's not on the test, you don't remember it. So that's the problem we got with observation. And that's why we outsource you to our museums and art instructors, which sends the message that's not what physicians do. But we do it. So try to force yourself, because you're not going to learn it. It's not going to be taught. You've got to teach yourself. Let me give you an example. So I live in Philly, and this is the Philadelphia Art Museum. And a couple of years ago, I was there with my wife, and we were fascinated by this painting of a Venetian lady. We have a house in Venice, so we spent quite a bit of time. It's not a big table. It's a wooden table, oil painting. And they tell us that it's painted by Jacometto Veneziano, 1470. All right, so the first thing, remember, the eye doesn't see what the mind doesn't know. You need to know a lot. If you know about art history, you realize that she's showing you the left hemiphase. And that is kind of standard by then. Because without even knowing neurology, and of course without the work of Sperry that won a Nobel Prize for his studies of brain lateralization, painters have realized that this is the most emotional side of the sitter, because it's controlled by the right brain. This is a study published in Nature. 70% of all portraits in the high Renaissance prioritize the left and me face, especially if the sitter is a woman. You're trying to capture the most emotional side. That's standard. 
What is not standard is that she's wearing lugubrious black. This is Venice. They were wearing red and gold and blue and green. Also, she's missing that silk camise that made decoltage not visible. So you see cleavage in Catholic Venice. That's unusual. And moreover, she only has an accoutrement, which is this yellow scarf. Yellow, for the Venetian, was a color of shame. It was associated with Jews and prostitutes. So she's a meretrice. She's a prostitute. She's one of the 11,164 tax-paying prostitutes. Ta and these were 10% of the population that made Venice the Las Vegas of her times. In 1416, they passed a law that forced these poor women to wear black, to wear an identifying yellow scarf, not to wear silk, and also not to wear jewelry. She doesn't have jewelry. All right, so she is a prostitute, and we know that because the back panel has an acronym, which is Latin for Fotum Luxuria Licentia Lascivia Lupa Fecit, which translates in the lupa. Isn't that interesting? Because that has some relevance for the medical findings. The lupa, the she-wolf devoted herself to last licentiousness. So maybe she died. Maybe she, this is a post-mortem. So now, as med students, I bet you first saw the medical findings. The eye doesn't see what the mind doesn't know. And of course, you were fascinated by the blush. OK, so what could that be? First thing that should go through your head is makeup. So if you go here to the med, Franz Hals has a painting at the Metropolitan Museum of New York of this young Dutch prostitute trying to lure a drunken customer into her tavern with a little dog that says, run away, syphilis, syphilis. But she's got makeup that spares the bridge of the nose. Our lady has it on the nose too, so it can't be makeup. How about secondary syphilis? She's a prostitute. Well, secondary syphilis gives you a blotchy, disseminated look. And moreover, secondary syphilis doesn't get to Italy until 1494. First description of secondary syphilis is Vienna, 1498. This painting is 1470. Could it be rosacea? It's missing the texture, plan, texture pattern. So folks, it has to be lupus. Yes, isn't that funny that they call her lupa? So this is the rash of lupus. Lupus would also explain why She's alopecic. Did you notice that the hair is a mess? And with lupus, you lose it. Would also explain why she's got a goiter. Because with lupus, 20 to 25% of patients have a hypothyroid autoimmune thyroiditis, especially if they have Sjogren's syndrome. Did you notice that the right eye is a bit shut? And also that she's got puffiness of the perimandibular area? That's inf inflammation of lacrimal and salivary glands, which means Sjogren. And if you got Sjogren, your thyroid is going to be goitrous even more likely. And finally, she's got red nose and red ears. That's cartilage. That means polychondritis, which is often associated with lupus. All of this to tell you that if this is lupus, who predate the first description by a left brain physician, who gave us this representation, his name was Kazenav, by 400 years. And all of this is Sherlockian, and it's fun. So Gretchen and I spent a good hour looking at this thing, and then what happened is that a friend of mine, who was the chief of medicine at the Cleveland Clinic, called me up and said, so I'm a Philly, come to my hotel. So I brought a bottle of wine, always good for conversation. Can you imagine Plato's Symposium on iced tea or Diet Coke? Would have never worked. So we drank the whole bottle. He's a rheumatologist. I know a lot about art. Then we ran it by my beautiful, my, my beautiful wife, who knows a lot about vision, and we got a paper in the Journal of General Internal Medicine. All of this to tell you that, yes, you can observe a lot by watching, but also you need to know a lot. The eye doesn't see what the mind doesn't know. So breathe, be omnivorously curious. This is probably the only book I recommend. It's also written by a New Yorker. So, uh, Alexander Horowitz is a canine psychologist. They exist. And she's a <laughs> Barnes here in New York. So she's got dogs. And she noticed that whenever she was walking her neighborhood with her dog, the dog was seeing things she didn't even notice. Then she got a kid. 
and she realized that the kid was paying attention to other things. So she got this great idea of uh, walking her neighborhood with 11 different professionals. One of them being an astute observer and a physician from Philadelphia, Dr. Lorber. And that's what she wrote, okay? So my advice is, yes, do the method, but also try to know as much as you can. All right, so let's go to the Prado. And when you go to the Prado, you find the statue of Velasquez outside, but inside you find his own self-portrait in this famous canvas called Las Meninas, the maid, maids of honor. The maids of honor are all taking care of this young little spoiled girl, who's the Infanta de España, the future queen. Mom and dad are reflected in the mirror, but I want you to pay attention to these lonely figures on the right, particularly the girl who looks dysmorphic, and you know enough about medicine to conclude that she's an achondroplastic dwarf. But the funny kid, the funny thing is that the kid is not a kid. He's an 18-year-old hypophysial dwarf. We know actually the names of these people. She was Maria Barbola, that despite the Italian name was actually a German dwarf. The other one is Nicola Pertusato, definitely Italian, and he was a kid with hypophysial dwarfism. He was actually 18 in that painting. Are you familiar with another Italian hypophysial dwarf? They went on to win five Golden Globes, Golden Bowls. In fact, I think he won again this year, six Golden Bowls. His name is Lionel Messi. He's called the Atomic Flea because he had no growth hormone as a kid in Argentina. He's the son of two immigrants from Marche, Italy. And the Argentinians didn't have the money to pay for his growth hormone. So Barcelona said, no problem, come over, we'll pay for it. And the rest, as they say, is history. This is another boy wonder. This is Mozart. And this, the very last portrait of Mozart we have, probably the most realistic of them all, was made by his brother-in-law, and it was an incomplete because Mozart died. So I want you to pay attention to this because he's got boggy eyes. And that intrigued astute observers who said, isn't that funny? Did he have renal failure? Well, the only thing we know about Mozart, he dies young, and he dies in a very cold winter in Vienna. It's a December, but it's not this December, you know, where we have 60. It's a cold winter. So he gets chills, he gets fever, he gets a cough, and pretty quickly he slides into a delirium and a coma, and he dies. So let's put it together. It sounds like some sort of pneumonia. Now, if you have a periorbital edema, you have renal failure. And Mozart, as a kid, was taken all over Europe by his father to make a few pennies and a few bucks. And the kid had recurrent tonsillitis, which means strep pharyngitis, which means strep glomerulonephritis and nephrotic syndrome. But the problem is that you don't only lose albumin, you also lose immunoglobulins. And if you lose immunoglobulins, you're not going to protect yourself against capsulated organisms like pneumococcus. And that's why people with nephrotic syndrome are at risk of pneumococcal sepsis, which sounds pretty much what Mozart died from. All right, so this is a patient with nephrotic syndrome. Remember that if you have nephrotic syndrome, you also get these xanthalasmas. So let's go to a very important museum, the Louvre. And of course, let's see the most famous painting in the world. Good luck with getting close there. And that's the problem, because you're not going to be able to see that the Mona Lisa has a xanthalasma. And Leonardo put it there, because they have done analysis, infrared photographs. This was put in by Leonardo. And interestingly enough, the Mona Lisa also has a xanthoma. So did she have this lipidemia? So this was written up, and of course, immediately caught the fancy of many people. These other guys immediately wrote the paper, and she said, well, probably she had primary biliary, biliary cholangitis. Now, recently, there was another paper that was published and described the fact that the Mona Lisa doesn't have much hair, that the lateral third of the eyebrow is missing, and they were even trying to see a goiter that personally I don't see. So in the Mayo Clinic, they published this paper saying that Mona Lisa must have been, must have been hypothyroid. All right, folks, what is the most important word in life and in medicine, of course? Bullshit.
okay? <laughs> the most important word is bullshit, because much of what people say is humba. You know, that's what Dickens would have called it. This is not the reason why Leonardo painted the Mona Lisa. Leonardo painted the Mona Lisa because he was intrigued by the human soul. And Leonardo was convinced that the soul is androgynous. So we have to strive to be whole. And that's why when he was kicked out of Italy was because he was studying fetuses. He was trying to figure out when these dead fetuses had their soul implanted, their androgynous soul. And when he crossed the Alps to go and die in France, on the back of his mules, he had the androgynous painting of a woman with a perplexing smile and the androgynous painting of a man with a perplexing smile. And when he died, he kept them at the bedside. He was very comfortable with ambiguity. And in this sketch, preparatory sketch, it's very androgynous because it's a hermaphrodite. It has a penis and a breast. Now, if you go to the Met, Franz Salz, National Gallery, Franz Salz also has a rendition of St. Thomas. And that predates the medical description. Now, another very important part for observation is do not see what the books tell you should be there if you don't see it. Remember, the most important word is bullshit. So a guy who said bullshit, although he said it in Flemish, because he was from Flanders, his name was Vesalius, was a young guy, he was 20-something, who had come from Flanders to study in Padua. And they forced his poor kids to read Galen from 1,500 years before. And he started noticing that there were things in real life that Galen didn't see, and vice versa. There were things that Galen wrote about that did not exist. And that's how Vesalius debunked Galen. So here's the example. These two paintings were made by Frank Netter, who was a physician and a good painter. They were made in the 70s, when if you have bad lung disease, whether you are a pink puffer on the left with emphysema or a blue bloater on the right with chronic bronchitis, you're going to have clubbing. But Netter only gave the clubbing to the bronchitic. And Netter is right. Because what we know now, thanks to this paper published in JAMA, the Rational Clinical Exam Series, in order to get clubbed, you need megakaryocytes that leave the bone marrow all the time to bypass the lung filter through a shunt and go to the periphery, wedge themselves in the unguial bed, obliterate the lovey bone angle, and give you the bulging. So why an emphysematous doesn't get it? Because they don't have shunts. They only have destruction. But the bronchitic, especially with the bronchiectasis component, is going to have these newly formed vessels that create a lot of shunt. And so Netter was right. This is the first description of clubbing, and it's by an artist. This is Dick Cat, who lived in the Netherlands between the two great wars. He's one of the great magical realist painters, and he had the trilogy of Fallot. So in all his 40 self-portraits, he gave himself acrocynosis, but also the loss of the lovey bone dangle, the balotability of the nail bed, bed, and the bulging of the distal phalanx. And he portrayed that consistently. Once again, you can observe a lot by watching. So what is this business of visual thinking? All right, 20 to 30% of us think in pictures. The vast majority think in words. And the reason is school. School takes away the crayon, gives you a pen, and turns you from a creative right-brain person into a left-brain person. That's why Calvin resents school, because Calvin is a creative kid. A creative kid who resented school was him. He was a visual thinker. And he was asked towards the end of his life, how do you think? And he says, words or language mean nothing in my thoughts. My thoughts are visual. Conventional words have to be laboriously sought after only later. So, if you're a visual thinker, it's anathema for you to memorize. And Einstein wrote it. One had to cram all this stuff into one's mind for the exam, whether one liked it or not. The coercion has such a deterring effect on me that after I passed the test, I found the consideration of any scientific problem distasteful. So the German method almost managed to turn off Albert Einstein. He solved the riddle of relativity at the end by imagining himself as a light beam. He was a visual thinker, and he concluded that imagination is more important than knowledge. Leonardo was a visual thinker. Every brain fart came out first as a sketch. And there are plenty of papers that suggest that if you think in pictures, you are more creative. Kenneth Clark writes, 
It's often said that Leonardo drew so well because he knew about things. No, no, it's much more likely that he knew about things because he drew so well. Leonardo boasted about this. Next to this amazing rendition of a bovine heart, he writes in mirror image. Remember, Leonardo probably was dyslexic, so you have to flip it in order to read the Italian. Writer, how can you describe this heart in words without filling an entire book? The longer you write, the more you will confuse the listener. And you would only end up knowing a few trees, never the forest. And here he goes for the jugular. Rider, what kind of words will you fetch to awkwardly describe what drawing can instead beautifully represent? Don't bother with words unless you're speaking to the blind. Don't mess with things that belong to the eyes. Don't try to smuggle them as something belonging instead to the ears. You will always be overruled by the painter. I like to verb words. What? Yeah, I take nouns and adjectives and use them as verbs. Remember when access was a thing? That's something you do, it got verbed. Verbing weirds language. Maybe we can eventually make language a complete impediment to understanding, which is, of course, the Babel Tower, nowadays called the European Union. <laughs> so these guys have 28 countries, 27 actually, one is trying to get out, and 24 languages. Will they ever be able to talk to each other? Let me give you a good example of the priority of the visual. This is a left brain physician presenting a new condition in 1858 through words. And I want you to visualize it. First among the peculiarities by which these patients may be identified is the tooth ensemble of their physiognomy. A pale earthy complexion, a thick pitted skin, a sunk and flattened nose, and scars of all fissures about the angles of the mouth often give the countenance so much of peculiarity that the condition may be recognized at first sight. The opinion is usually borne out by further observing that the subject is of short stature, has a large protruding forehead, and a heavy aspect. All right, can you see it? I can't. But this was Hutchinson describing congenital syphilis. Pretty quickly, Ibsen used it for his play, The Ghosts. But the funny thing is that congenital syphilis had first been described by a painter, a Dutch painter, Rembrandt. And the painting is here in New York. If you go to the Met, ask for the lemon's wing, and you will see the painting of Gerard de la Res, who was only 24 and a genius. But according to the Dutch, he had a nauseating appearance. Let's review. First of all, he has the borse of Parot. He's got short cheekbones, a saddle nose, he's got a protruding chin, and he's got the raggedies, the scars, the wrinkles, and the guy went blind which is part of the interstitial keratitis triad of Hutchinson. So all of this to say that yes, drawing, visual thinking is the root of everything. I'm gonna finish up with sculpture. And I'm gonna give you my favorite Roman emperor, who was a Renaissance man before the Renaissance. He's 62. He's a medical school dropout. He loves everything related to the Greeks. And in Rome, they call him the Greekling, which is not a compliment. And then they giggle because he's got a Spanish accent. Then he has three senators executed and the giggling stops. And all of this because the guy is not an easy one. He's competitive, irascible. But now he's too short of breath to argue with you. So he tells you that he's had a lot of nosebleeds. And you see that the belly is swollen, the neck veins are distended, the legs are edematous. And those nosebleeds, if only Scipione Rivarocci in Pavia, Italy, had already invented the blood pressure cuff, would tell you that he's probably hypertensive. But you're fascinated by his ears. And the guy has an earlobe crease. So this is Frank Sign. We call it nowadays Frank Sign. Why? St. T. Frank writes a letter to the New England Journal of Medicine in the 70s saying, I got a bunch of patients in clinic with an earlobe crease. They all have coronary artery disease. Anybody reported it? And they say, no, welcome to Frank Sign. Every single bust of Emperor Hadrian has an earlobe crease, whether in Rome, or in Naples, or in Madrid, or in Athens, or in Florence. Even the coins have a funny looking ear. So here's the deal. There is a congenital variety, but I'm talking about the acquire. The acquire is an infarct of the earlobe. The earlobe has terminal circulation, like heart and brain. And so if you clog it, you get an infarct here, and here, and here. Notice that this guy has a preauricular crease. That makes it even more likely 
to be real. An example, 1,000 patients admitted to the hospital. 74% of decreased had coronary artery disease compared to 16% of the creaseless. 60 studies have corroborated that. So all of this to say that this is helpful. And Adrian dies of heart failure. Cassius Dio tells us, despite his recourse to certain charms and magics that relieve this dropsy, his anasarca, he soon filled up with water and got short of breath. He was, in fact, slowly getting worse and dying day by day. He even asked for a poison or a sword. He wanted to be euthanized. Nobody did it. Finally, he abandoned his careful regimen, and by indulging in unsuitable food and drinks, he met his death, shouting loud, the popular saying that many doctors have killed the king, which proves that even in the Roman Empire, they didn't like us. So what happened to him? He leaves us a fragment of a poem, little soul of mine, roamer and charmer, guest and companion of my body. Where will you soon go? Pale, cold, naked, probably to a place where you won't be able to crack jokes anymore. Actually, he went to this beautiful mausoleum, which became Castle Sant'Angelo. All right, so Hadrian had it, and George got it, because I spent quite a few years looking at George Bush years, and I can tell you that he got an earlobe crease while in office. So let's magnify the presidential year. He's got a preauricular crease, that's bad, and he also has hair sticking out of the canal, which is not good. Visually unappealing, but also three studies that suggest that this is hypertestosteronemic state, so it's coronary artery disease. So George has that, but you're going to say, yeah, right, but George is always on his mountain bike, and the good doctors at the White House said that he has the lowest risk of coronary artery disease. Never say that. You're going to look like a fool, because George got stented, and that means his earlobe knew it all along. So this is me when uh, Jefferson students gave me a portrait as their best teacher, and at that time my left ear is intact, that's 15 years ago. But now I have an earlobe crease because she ran for office and I got an earlobe crease. <laughs> so, if on an ear there is a crease, do not assume the life will cease. If hair is knotted in the ear, do not assume that death is near. If when walking down the street, an ear with air and crease you meet, don't give the gent a dreadful fright. Don't hint infarction is inside. It's just a sign. All right, lastly, folks, got three minutes to finish up. Remember, the Pantheon was actually designed by Hadrian, and inside the Pantheon is the grave of Raphael. Raphael died in Rome of malaria. He was 37 on a Good Friday. He had been born on a Good Friday. And when he dies, they enter the studio and they find the last painting of his mistress, the only one where she has frontal nudity. Margherita Luti is pointing to her breast, and the breast is abnormal. There is a mass. There is skin discoloration. There is retraction. There is a satellite node, and people say, wow, he saw breast cancer, never described by a physician until the neck. Turns out that, yes, that's the only one with frontal nudity, and after Raphael's death, she went to an nunnery and never came out alive. So I'm going to finish up by showing you that Raphael gave us, of course, this, which is his masterpiece. That's Plato, which is Leonardo. That's a self-portrait. But I want you to look at Michelangelo playing Heraclitus. He's only 34. But Michelangelo has bumps on his knees, and that's gout. Michelangelo is very young and has tophi, and Michelangelo gave us tons of symbolisms. So now, at the end of this talk, can you look at this famous fresco and the cloud around God with a different eye? Does it remind you of anything you studied in anatomy? It's a brain. It's a sagittal section of the brain. What Michelangelo was doing, and Michelangelo was dissecting, was saying, God gave us the brain as his greatest gift. Or maybe God is a figment of the brain. See the ambiguity? Plenty of symbolisms. There is a book about that. There is no Da Vinci code. There is a Michelangelo code. This is the brainstem, the throat of God. I like this one, the right heart. And of course, I like this because I'm a pulmonologist. The trachea. All right, folks, summary. Flexner gave us the sciences, 1910. We need an Osler report to put back the humanities. We need Osler before we need Flexner. We need to bring in humanists and turn them into scientists. The other way around doesn't work. In the end, you need them both. And Osler said it. 
Humanities and science are twin berries. Grievous damage has been done by regarding them in any other light than complemental. You need to be a symphony of hemispheres. So I'm going to leave you with him, who was a great observer. First description of rhinophyma and rosacea on himself. First description of congenital syphilis. First description, if Raphael didn't get there, of breast cancer. This is his mistress. She died probably of breast cancer. And finally, great description of depression on himself. This is 1659. It's uh, at the National Gallery. I wrote a paper on it. So I'm going to leave you with a morphing of two minutes of all his self-portraits. His life was difficult. He died a pauper. He died bankrupted, homeless, essentially, in a pauper's grave without a name. And so this gives you a sense of the human condition. <laughs>